Buongiorno Milano. It's very nice to be here. Um, today, I, I know I'm supposed to be the banking expert, but before I, I thought I would talk about banking, I have to talk about social first. Um, because uh, this is social business, not business social forum, right? So, um, I, I thought I would start with an observation. This is the wireless radio. Wireless meant something different back at the turn of the 20th century, not Wi-Fi. Wireless was this uh, radio, you know, invented by Marconi, uh, the wireless uh, radio, so very popular in this part of the world. But when radio first came along, many people believed it would be very destructive, very disruptive. In fact, people said that radio had the potential for moral decay and to produce uh, bad behaviors amongst people. They were afraid that people would sit around the radio listening for hours when instead they could be sitting around the table reading scripture or having a sing-along with the family on the piano or something like this. This was seen as a disruptive force. It's interesting, isn't it? We hear the same things about the internet and social media, mobile, the sharing economy now, disruption. But radio was seen as disruptive. Now the first people who wanted to make money or thought they could make money from radio were the networks, the radio program content producers. They would come into this space and later on we had advertisers come into this space trying to sell the product through the radio. We see this occurring each time new types of media come into play. So when the television came along, the same thing happened. People said, it's going to be disruptive. It's bad for, for society. It's going to result in moral decay, people wasting time. It's going to take away from the, the activity of listening to the radio. <laughs> right? And the first companies that thought they could make money out of this was the big TV networks. They come on and they, they own the content. So this is where the money is, right? Owning the content. But then later on, we saw advertisers come along and say, well, no, this is where we can make money. We can start to promote businesses. And some brands, edge brands like Coca-Cola and uh, you know, Procter and Gamble's products, all of these household products, these products came of age really as a result of the television, first uh, popularized back in the 1950s. By 1950, about one million households in the United States had uh, TVs. By then, it started to take off very quickly all around the world. But first, everyone thinks it's owning the content. That's where you make the money. And then secondly, no, no, no. You know, it's the advertising. This is where the real opportunity is. Then along comes the internet. And what do people say about the internet? Oh, well, it's, it's going to be disruptive. It's going to result in moral decay. People wasting time. We've heard this so many times before. And who's going to win on this? Well, the first companies that think they're going to make big money on the internet, companies like AOL, Yahoo, owning the content was the most important thing. This was where you make your money. And then the advertiser said, no, 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 no. Now we're going to come along and we can now sell. We can do marketing. This is where we can make money for many businesses. But you know what? This is, this is where they were wrong. Even though today, internet and uh, this, we call this new media, digital advertising, is overtaking traditional advertising in terms of effectiveness and in terms of spend, the real success with the internet was not about messaging. And this was something that was very different for this media. See, radio was about messaging. TV was about messaging. And when the internet came along, we thought it was about messaging, but it wasn't. It was really about a dialogue, a connection with customers in ways that we couldn't do before. So companies like Amazon came along and said, you know what, the real trick 
is being disruptive, but not morally disruptive, but disruptive from a business perspective. Let's do business differently on this platform than we have traditionally. This is where the opportunity is. Then along comes social media. And everyone says, ah, oh, social media. It's going to be bad for our kids. They're going to waste time. They're going to be doing all of these, sharing uh, photos with each other that they shouldn't and all of these things. No, you know, and the only companies that are going to make money out of this is Facebook and Twitter. And then the advertisers came along and they said, no, 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 let's use this as a messaging platform. Let's put more messages to uh, consumers through social media. This is how we can monetize social media. Social media is all about marketing. But this is, again, the reaction of new media platforms. This is what most people think. The real opportunity for social media, though, is not marketing. It's creating connections with communities that aren't possible through other mediums. It's things like Kickstarter, where you know, this has created a platform for the creation of new businesses very quickly that couldn't have got funding through traditional approaches of business, like the iPebble watch. Or businesses like, um, can we have the next slide? This seems to have stopped working for a moment. Okay, Airbnb. Putting together communities of people, doing businesses in ways that would not have been practical or would not have been affordable in the previous, with previous business platforms. And even in banking, we have, you know, Zopa uh, is based here uh, in, the, in, uh, in Italy. They have an office, but also in the UK. This was the world's first peer-to-peer -peer lending model. So this is a social network for people who want to borrow and lend money that circumvents traditional banks. Instead of uh, going to a bank and depositing your money and the bank lending that money out to uh, someone else, this creates a platform for borrowers and lenders to get together. So someone who wants a, a better savings rate than the bank can put their money with Zopa, and Zopa will find someone who wants to lend that money at a higher rate. Zopa takes a little bit of margin, but both borrowers and sa the savers and the lenders are better off on this model than through a traditional bank. These are new businesses that have been created on top of community, and this is the real opportunity. And we haven't even started to see social business yet. This is still, over the next 10 years, the number of social businesses that will be born, we can't even think of them right now. Because it's their connection to community that will differentiate their commerce model across this platform. And it can't be done in the same way through television or radio or even the internet. It requires social as the glue to conduct commerce. So what does this uh, all have to do with us? Well, we live in a world today where obviously sharing, information scarcity, all of this uh, um, tremendous amount of content is producing significant changes. It's changing the value of business. It's changing the value of advice. In the past, you know, banks would think the, the, the way they differentiated is someone could come into a bank branch, maybe into Monte de Pasca de Siena, the oldest bank in the world, and get advice. But today in a world where information is available so readily, so easily through the mediums that we have online and through digital, then can you differentiate on knowledge, on advice? Well, this is predicated on information scarcity, that you know something that your customer doesn't know. This is a change that social media has also produced. And it's produced pressure on the system because transparency is another side effect of social commerce. You can no longer have differential pricing that can't be exposed. You can't uh, treat one customer better than another customer without good cause. You have, to, you have to have your business practices exposed. And this has produced pressure on the financial system. Now, banks think this is great service. You come into a bank branch, you meet a uh, banker, and they can see you face to face. And all of their marketing activities to date have been focused on this funnel of getting a customer in the branch. 
And you can see, you know, in newspaper ads and TV commercials and these billboards, let's get a customer into the branch, they sign an application form, and maybe, if they're not too risky and we like you, we might just let you be our customer. This is the model of banking that we've seen in the past. But this model is breaking down because of these new medias, these new platforms, these shifts in consumer behavior. So we used to have a physical system but we've seen this happen before in books and music where a physical product can be displaced by a digital product. An e-book on a Kindle or music downloaded on your iPod. But banking, oh, it's different, right? We have our physical products, our physical bank account. Maybe in the 60s, you might have had a passbook like this. This is the way we used to do our banking. And then uh, maybe in the 70s and 80s, you had a checkbook. And today, the physical product for banking is a debit card. And this is what we use to do our banking day to day. We use a debit card more than any other artifact associated with banking. But there's a problem with a debit card. You pull this out and you go into a store and you buy something. What can the debit card tell you? Only two things. You swipe and it says approved or declined. That's it. So this, despite all of the advancements in technology, this is dumb. This can't tell us much information at all. It's ready for a change. So if you wanted to have a, if you wanted to have a bank artifact, a bank account that could be smart, could tell you maybe what's the most important piece of information you need to know about your bank account, do you think? Maybe let's start with my account balance. Yeah? This is the number one requested piece of information from a retail bank today by customers. What is my account balance? So let me think, what could we have that could provide us with an account balance before we make a transaction, but also allow us to make the transaction and then give us information after that? Well, maybe we could use the internet. But, you know, you could log in and you can get your account balance off the internet, but this is a bit clumsy to do this all of the time. You, you don't carry around your Mac or your tablet with you all the time necessarily. But we started to see some changes in behavior when the internet came along. People now started to visit bank branches less. They were doing less of their banking in a bank branch. So we started to see this shift. Physical product, physical store, physical product, now we have a digital store that changes people's behavior. But the real shift is when the iPod comes along or the Kindle comes along that changes people's buying behavior. No longer do they visit a bookstore to buy a book. No longer do they visit the music store to buy music because it's just more convenient to download that book to their Kindle or download music to their iPod. So what's it going to be for the banking industry? Well, the fastest growing products in the banking industry today are things like this, prepaid debit cards. And people are looking for the utility of banking, but they're not going to banks as much because it's not only banks that can provide the utility of banking today. In fact, if I want to send you money, it's easier for me to use PayPal than it is to use a traditional bank. Because traditional banks says, well, I need to know your account number, your routing number, your sort code, your SWIFT code, your bank branch address, all of this information. And PayPal says, no, 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 just give me your email address. I'll send you some money. So there are better ways at doing banking today that don't necessarily involve banks. So then we have the emergence of the digital bank account, the s smartphone. Now, you know, we talk about Google Wallet and technologies like this where you can pay with your phone, but the real trick is going to be contextualization of your day to day banking experience. So when you pull out your phone and you pay at a store, this is the sort of receipt that we give you with Movin, with our product that we have in the United States. You have, you can see how much you've paid in this store. Uh, you bought a coffee this morning, five bucks or five euro for a coffee, and you've spent uh, 30 euro at this store already, at this coffee house uh, already this month. But did you know you spent 200 euro on dining out? 
Now, this is useful information to get every day you're making that transaction. This is great advice. Better advice than walking into a bank branch once a year and asking someone about some uh, mortgage facility in the branch. This, we can now deliver advice in real time every single day that you're using your bank account. This is a smart bank account. So what are the ways we're going to connect in the future? Well, think about this. The kids who are coming into the commerce system right now, they're going to be banking and going to be doing business and going to be your customers and your clients in the future. They've grown up in a world where digital is just part of their normal life. So for them, they're going to be mobile banking first. That means they're going to use their mobile banking more than any other banking channel just within a couple of years. And the rest of us will follow suit soon after. But here's the point. By 2016, the number of digital interactions with a bank via a mobile phone or a tablet or via a browser will outnumber a face-to-face -face interaction 400 to 1. So if you're a banker and you're thinking that a visit to a bank branch is where the relationship with your customer happens, you have to really start to rethink this. Your relationship with your customer is first and foremost in the digital sphere, not in face-to-face. -face. You can't compete with me if I'm really good digitally with talking to customers and you have great branches, you cannot compete. You have to have a total relationship with the customer. And sure, branches will not go away, but the number of branches will shrink and people will keep visiting them less because digital will be the way they do their day-to-day -day banking. Now, 80% of these Y-Gens, they've bought a product based off a friend's recommendation. So the way they're going to learn about new products on this new social sphere is going to be from friends' recommendations or maybe restaurants that they visit. They're going to look at where their friends have checked in and what, what, friends, uh, what restaurants their friends like. This is the way they think about that. Their instinct is not going to be to go to a bank branch. Think about this. These kids. For us, we might think of social media as new and exciting and as disruptive technology from a business perspective. But these kids have grown up with a mobile phone. They've grown up with internet. They've never lived their life a, a day without a connection to the internet. They've grown up with social media. To them, this is just normal. It's not different. It's not new. It's not disruptive. This is just the way they live their life. So how are you going to deal with a customer who's grown up with technology that make, makes up his DNA in terms of his everyday life? A customer like this. Where's the button on the iPad, huh? She loves it. So this is my friend's daughter. She's about four years old now. When this video was taken, she was just 14 months old. And I'm sure you've had a similar experience with maybe your kids. Here's the thing. For these kids, they've grown up with this technology. It's not new. It's just the way they live their life. So they're going to be thinking about amazing new ways to connect, to do business, to explore. Yeah. These interactions are going to change. The next 10, 20 years, we haven't even seen what social can do for business yet. It's only just beginning. The next 10, 20 years with mobile and geolocation and rich data overlay, all of these technologies, it's just going to blow this apart. But you might have to teach your kids what these two things had in common. 
Do you remember that? Rewinding the cassette tape, yeah? You might have to teach them this. So you might have to teach them why they used to message your friends with this technology. Right? In fact, we had recently one, uh, one uh, young uh, kid working in the office. He didn't know where to put the stamp on the envelope. Do I put it on the back? or This is a new skill for him. right? Or maybe why you had to rewind these to take them back to the video store. Remember? They used to penalize you if you didn't rewind them. And the same vein, why you use checks to send money. Why on earth would you do that? So, you know, you think about things like this, it's just the same. It, you know, the, these, this is actually a training course for young kids in America learning how to write checks. This is crazy, right? Behavior of customers is changing. If we don't change our behavior as organizations for these kids, who are going to represent almost half of the retail consumer base by 2020, then we leave a gap open, a gap for competitors who behave more like these kids than we do. We have to start to align our behavior. And gamification, I think, is a really interesting area to explore. See, mobile plus context, social, this is a way to really create very interesting engagements, psychological, behavioral, Something is different. This is not playing a game on your phone. This is not what I'm talking about here. This is starting to challenge us, engage us, get our minds thinking. Things like the Nike Fuel Band or the E39 Armour from Under Armour or the Fitbit. You know, these things get you to compete against yourself each day to see if you can get healthier, fitter. How could we uh, turn this into a tool for banking, for day-to-day -day spending? Well, think about this. What about if you walk into a shoe store here in Milano and you're looking at to buy something, some shoes? Your phone should be able to tell you if you can afford to buy those shoes or if there's a better deal around the corner, or what your friends say about this product. This is all information that we'll soon have at our fingertips. And whether it's Google Glasses, or whether you're using a smartphone, or it's some other technology, we are now having this rich overlay environment coming into play. And it's, see, recommendations are going to be live. Advice is going to be live. The way we make decisions is now going to be influenced in real time based on technology. This is where the interesting opportunity is. So, you know, at Movin, we gamify financial wellness. We gamify your spending. So we make this a game so that every month you're competing against yourself to spend less money. Because if you spend less money, what happens? You save. So it's very simple for us. This is the game of banking. And this is how we're, we think of banking moving forward in this new environment. But think about this, maybe in the future you walk in with your Google Glasses into a car dealership and you'll be looking at this car and your bank will be able to tell you whether you can afford it, whether you're pre-approved for a loan or a lease for that vehicle and how much it's going to cost you every month. This could be happening in real time. And a bank that insists on you coming down to the bank branch to sign a form, they don't understand this technology. Or maybe you walk into a store and you see that flat screen TV. Oh, I'd like to buy this new Xbox or a new PlayStation or a new flat screen TV. They have this 4K now. And you're looking at this flat screen TV and your bank reminds you or your phone reminds you or your glasses remind you that if you buy this, you won't have enough money to pay your rent next month. That's good advice. So all of these changes that are happening in social and business are very exciting. But the opportunity is that for things like banking, banking is no longer about a place you go to. It's now something you do. And I want you to think about this. What is so how is social? How is geolocation? How is context? How is this rich data overlay changing the context of your business for the customers that you deal with? Because when you can change the value of your product or your service, when and where your customers need it the most, that's the moment of truth that we're looking for in this rich environment. And that's what I like to call Bank 3.0. Thank you very much.